So hello everybody, my name is Kent Bai. I host the Voices of VR podcast. Today I'm gonna to do my best to try to summarize the highlights and as much as I can from 400 Voices of VR interviews. And I'll kind of walk through my process a little bit of how I tried to approach this. So first of all, I started my podcast back on May 19th, 2014. And so SVR Conference and Expo is kind of like my anniversary where I really just announced it for the first time that, hey, I'm gonna do this. I had produced a number of podcasts before and then across that day and a half, I did 46 interviews with a lot of the key exhibitors and speakers that kind of started and kickstarted this Voices of VR podcast. So if you go all the way back and start from episode like five or six, that's when I started from the conference. I did a few episodes before that. And part of the reason was because there was no journalism that was covering what was happening in the IEEE VR. There was a little bit of a split between the new VR and old VR. And so I wanted to start to cover the vast knowledge of academic research that's been happening in VR for 20 to 50 years. And it was almost like the uh, consumer VR was kind of ignoring that. And that upset me, so I just decided to do something about it by covering it. I started with some of those interviews and I came to SVR and really kicked off the interviews there. So this is just sort of a graphic of the 400 Voices of VR interviews. And I've only published 352 at this point, but I've got a backlog that exceeds 400. And so as I'm looking at this, I'm trying to figure out the patterns and how do I make sense of this? And I've gone to different conferences, so I cover gaming and storytelling and the education and academic research. So the one question that kind of unifies this, though, that I ask all of my people that I interview is, what is the ultimate potential of VR? And it's an interesting little litmus test, if you notice. Some people have thought about this quite a bit, and they already have an answer. Or they've been a listener to the podcast, and they think about their own answer each time they listen. And so people either kind of give a, a generalized answer, or they do something very specific to what they're working on, which I, that's my personal favorite, when they just take what they're doing and they just expand it out in terms of what VR can do to transform whatever they're doing. But I, I kind of see the answer to this question is a little bit like this thing where there's all these blind men who are touching an elephant, you know? And each person is touching different part of the elephant, but no one person can see the whole thing. And that's what I feel like we're kind of at right now is that no one really knows the answer to this because things are changing so quickly. But you get enough people with their hands on the elephant, you get a little bit of a sense of where this is all going. And so that's what I'm trying to do with the Voices of VR podcast is take those samples of seeing where people think this is all headed. And by you listening, then people are then going to get inspired and then go help create those futures. So that's kind of the intent of what I'm doing. So Tipitat Shavasan has this graphic that if anybody wants the details of this, if you go to my Twitter feed, at Kent Buy, you can see the details of this or just search VR Fund Industry Landscape and it should come up. But this is really from the perspective of a VC. So Tipitat started his own VR fund and he's looking at like startups and companies. Now, there's a whole range of companies that have been doing VR for ages that are not represented here. So this is really the new consumer VR that's recently emerged. And there's all sorts of different companies that are not represented. Tipitat has a Trello board where he tries to more comprehensively track all the different companies that are out there. So, but I did a little experiment to see like, okay, if this is a sampling of Tipitat's snapshot of the industry, then what have I covered on the Voices of VR? And I looked at it and it was like around like 44% of companies that are on here. And so I've tried to cover a good cross section, but then, you know, I realized it's not necessarily my goal to get to 100%. If I just get to 100%, then that's not why I'm doing this. I'm doing this because of something else. And, you know, this only represents like 50 or 60 of over 400 interviews I've done. So there's all different dimensions that are not covered in this. So that really lent me to try to think about, well, how would I start to understand the landscape of VR? And so I came up with this, the human experience of virtual reality. So I think that when I ask people about what do they think the ultimate potential of VR, more often than not, I can start to categorize some of their answers into one of these 12 buckets. And I'll be kind of diving into some of these, but right now the biggest one that I'll dive into first is entertainment. So by and far, a lot of VR to start off is gonna be gaming and storytelling. There's an element of cinematic VR, 360 video. Pornography is in this realm. And when I look at the different innovations in storytelling and the challenges, if people haven't heard the interview I did with Devin Dolan, I think that's a really good overview in terms of like 
here's the four different types of storytelling. You're either a ghost or you're a character in the story, or you have impact or you don't. Either you have some sort of agency within the world where you either control and impact the environment, or maybe you're be able to walk around and see things, but you're not able to actually do anything of consequence. And so thinking about the narratives in VR and what VR enables in terms of storytelling, I think is going to be something that I'm going to continue to look into and explore because there's just so many possibilities and really just at the beginning and Kevin Cornish is in the audience, uh, Rob Morgan. I'll be putting together more like top 10 lists as well to kind of dive into each of these. So, and of course gaming is a huge thing. You know, it's hard to even pick out any sort of like thing, but I've really been focusing on like the game mechanics and what are the things that people find fun, what's engaging, what's entertaining. And I think a lot of things that are being proved out in the gaming will feed into other aspects of VR and all the different dimensions because it's fundamentally an interactive platform. Platform. So back to this, I wanted to kind of give a little bit more of an overview of this by looking at the cardinal angles here of the two spectrums between either you're talking about your identity and your sense of self or in the other extreme you have empathy and partnership. So it's this axis between self and other. So you can kind of think about it as you know, looking at this axis from between self and other is that either you're having an experience of your own agency or you're empathizing with somebody else's experience. And so it's really hard to do both. So when you're thinking about storytelling or games, is it more about your agency and will within the experience or is it about telling someone else's experience? And so Fran Pachetta had some of the really interesting comments about this in her six by nine experience because you're in an experience of solitary confinement and she was doing interviews with people who were giving like a first person account of their experience in solitary confinement. And she's like, you know, that didn't really work at all because it's about your experience in solitary confinement. So she had people address you as the experiencer as you will experience this, you will notice the cracks in the wall. And so anything that increases your sense of presence and your sense of agency, that I think is gonna be a big dynamic. On the other extreme, you can start to get into empathy and storytelling, but you may actually want less interactivity. So the Gear VR that has limited capabilities of interactivity may actually be the best platform to do storytelling in VR. So that's sort of one insight here. And then the other dimension is your own private experiences versus public experiences. And so there's a lot of people who talk about how VR is going to connect them more to their family. So I'll be diving into that. And the other extreme is like you are talking about using VR in the enterprise for your career. It's applying to your reputation in the world. So it's either your private experience at home or in the world. And so roughly all the other different dimensions here are kind of fitting into that and we'll be exploring and unpacking that a bit more there at the end. But let's dive into identity because you know, identity, I think, is the biggest thing about virtual reality and something that the academic community actually has a lot of insight into in terms of presence research. So Mel Slater and Richard Scarbez, and if you look at my top 10 list of Voices of VR podcast episodes, I talk a lot about the play solution and plausibility illusion. So these are the two cornerstones of creating an experience that has presence, is that you have to give this sense of place which the VR on its own can do, but then the plausibility is the key thing. That's the thing that presence is like a house of cards, and if you don't get the plausibility right, it can just collapse. And so you have to do things like have believable social interactions and body language. There's a, a guy named Ross Mead talking about body language in VR and talking about the impact of eye contact. So technolist Blair Renault was talking about that in terms of the impact of what they're trying to do with adding subtle body language cues to overcome the uncanny valley. And then there's lots of different interviews that I've done in terms of kind of expanding on that plausibility and place illusion dynamic. But one thing that I'll say, Richard Scarbez's interview where he talks about the uncanny valley is n-dimensional. And what he meant by that is that it's kind of like a biggest mistake or trend that I see in VR is this trend towards photorealism. But the paradoxical thing about going towards photorealism is that the more that you go photoreal, the more that you expect everything in the experience has to be matched that level of fidelity. So if you don't get the haptics and the sound and everything, you're just, your mind is just going to be like, nope, I'm not in this forest right now. I'm in my living room watching a video of a forest. And so when you start to lower down the level of fidelity and start to do these art styles that give this sense of presence for people, then that can actually create a better sense of embodied presence if that's what you're going for. You may be a storyteller that's more interested in other things. But this is a, a dynamic that it could lead to non-intuitive decisions where you decide to dial down the level of graphic fidelity in order to increase the level of presence.
So another thing that I think is really interesting that we're going to see a lot more of when we start to do full body tracking, right now we're just doing hands, so we're not even doing the feet. But when we start to get the feet into tracking, I know I had my first experience of the virtual body ownership illusion at Sundance when I had this fully tracked presence. And it's a world of difference when you start to really believe that your virtual body is your body. When we start to have room scale experiences where the full body is tracked, then you're going to start to identify with that and Mel Slater's research into this in terms of the implications of your identity, of being able to change your implicit racial bias with a VR experience. You know, I think their early findings is that it has a short-term impact. They don't know the long-term impact yet, but the implication is that we got to be careful. If you're going around and killing people in VR, then what's the implication of that in terms of your sense of identity? So there's all sorts of open questions there, but the virtual body ownership illusion, I think, is one of the most interesting ones. On Kenny Valley, I've covered in a lot of different podcasts. Haptics, I think, is going to be huge, and specifically to that mixed reality. So having mixed reality experiences that you actually have a sense of touch and presence, that's going to vastly increase the presence. And embodied cognition is another area that came up a lot at the IEEE VR, and that is essentially that the more that you start to embody um, one, one interview that I'll be putting out is uh, teaching computational thinking through dance, for example. So, you know, doing a certain dance sequence and then breaking that down into an algorithm. And then that's how they're teaching kids. And so when they're trying to code it, then they're like, oh, okay, if I, you know, move my feet twice and then I clap, and then that can be a conditional statement. And so they're able to put things into their body. And then as you put it into your body, that actually improves your thinking. So this is an actually huge field in psychology that I think that embodied cognition is something that virtual reality developers would benefit you a lot to learn more about that. So I've done a few interviews about that and more to come. So empathy and partnership. For me, empathy is all about being able to carry multiple perspectives. And so going beyond the vulnerability of a first person perspective with Rose Troche, that was a great interview that I did where she's talking about like we have our own pre-existing narratives and biases and that VR has the capability of breaking us out of that. And so this other dimension of the other, of empathy and partnership is going to do a lot of that. There's a thing that I talked about already with agency versus empathy. There's a tension there, and I think that they're diametrically opposed to each other, so that's something to keep in mind. Creating shared realities is, I think, the ultimate goal of empathy is that once you empathize with someone, you're in some sense sharing the same reality as they are. Rather than someone having their own experience, you're having a shared experience at that point. And I think that as VR grows, we're going to have more and more people sharing experiences and sharing context with each other rather than people getting trapped into a fear state where it's their own personal experience. I think we're going to see a lot more about romantic dates, like your partner, your, your lover, your beloved doing things in VR with your partner in that way, I think is going to be a special niche where you're going out on a date in VR. And it'll be interesting to see what kind of VR experiences that we have for that. And we haven't really seen a lot of that yet. But given this kind of model, I think we'll see that. I think AI is uh, interesting, artificial intelligence, because I think it is kind of a partner in some ways. It's the other, like we are feeding our collective consciousness into the AI, and it's feeding it back to us with all this trained information. So I would put AI in this field, which I think is a huge thing that's growing. Just quickly through this part, telepresence with your family, life capture, Tom Furness talking about like we're going to be able to connect with our ancestors directly, being able to capture yourself and then have your grandchildren and great-grandchildren be able to share an experience of who you are. We're going to have Ready Player One chat rooms with people who are creating their own sense of their home, their virtual home. Like your little home, we're going to have the Internet of Things that's going to have all sorts of tie-ins to augmented reality. And your AR is going to be the interface to your devices in the Internet of Things. And there's going to be all sorts of relaxation experiences as well. And then just briefly in the enterprise and career, you know, there's a lot of things of people using VR in your job for training, for professional applications. And there's going to be a dimension of social capital and reputation as well. And so you have a reputation in your real life, but you're going to start to have these cultures where you have your reputation within certain virtual spaces that may or may not translate into real life, which I think is going to be interesting. So just to close it out, as we have just a few more minutes left, I did my best to try to give you a story of this human experience of virtual reality. And I want to just expand on a few things. First of all, the technology and medicine here. So first of all, the medicine, medical is going to be a huge thing and all sorts of things it's going to enable. But the technology aspect is something that I've struggled with recently in terms of the voices of VR because 
Sometimes I, I feel like, oh, it's interesting to really dive into the weeds of the technology, but am I really interested in it? And I found that there's a kind of a polar opposite relationship here between the technology and the imagination and the subconscious. The point is that the more that you learn about the capabilities of the technology, the more that you're going to expand what's possible to lowering the barrier from your imagination to making that happen within VR. Because the more that you know about these tools, the more that you're going to be able to actually create things. And I think that it's kind of an interesting relationship that you have to kind of do the hard work. And if you are listening to the podcast, you are doing that by learning about the technology so that you can start to really open up your mind and have no limitations to what you want to do with tapping into your imagination and your subconscious. So there's a early education and communication and higher education, travel, spirituality. I've separated this out because, you know, early education is a lot about, like, as you're developing and forming, there's kind of a set theory and philosophy around that. But then there's a certain age after that that you go into higher education. And I think that there's going to be a whole lot of areas of higher education in VR, kind of just casual education that you do. Just by listening to the voices of VR, that's a one level of higher education that you're already engaged with. So just imagine the different possibilities of targeting adults for education, for just their own curiosity rather than to try to help teach them to pass a test or, you know, it's just going to be something like, oh, I just want to learn about like Roman history. Let me dive into this experience and go do that. And travel, there's a big part about exploration as well. And the virtual goods and resources, I think that there's going to be a whole layer of different aspects of this digital economy and making money, but also like goods that only have worth within the digital world. So that's going to be another element as well. And then the big other one in the upper left screen in the 11th position, the uh, social and community, that's kind of the sweet spot of VR in a lot of ways of being able to connect to other people and to have this sense of cultivating your community and world building that you're going to be able to do where you're having shared experiences with your friends and being able to cultivate virtual community in that way. And death is something that I, I put on here because it's part of the human experience, you know, and there's not a lot of VR that's out there yet, but I think that this is an element where in terms of death and rebirth cycles and loss and impermanence, there's going to be a lot of aspects of that's just a part of human life and that I think VR actually is a medium that can explore the issue of death better than any other medium. You know, I've done some of that early just you know, kind of doing a grief ritual on my own. And I, I think there's a lot of power there. And I think there's other elements there that will continue to get fleshed out. So um, that is my best effort that I could do to try to summarize 400 episodes. And I know that it's a tough task and that I will be continuing moving forward to try to look at my archives and categorize things in different ways for people to kind of dive in into a deeper dive. And so, yeah, I just, I know that we're right at uh, noon and there's lunch that's starting, but if people want to hang around and ask a few questions, uh, I'd be happy to, to answer anything that may come up. Yeah. The question here was, why am I recording these interviews as a audio podcast rather than a 360 degree video? Well, that's because it wouldn't be logistically possible for me to do the volume of work that I do, first of all. But also, audio has a different quality. People change when you start putting a video camera on them. It's a little bit more intimate that you can, intimacy that you can get with audio. And frankly, I wouldn't want to have to deal with the volume of content that I have. I've done 4.6 days of audio. Also, in terms of consuming, nobody wants to watch a half hour or hour long video in VR because it's really not adding that much to the experience. Like you actually have a better experience, I would argue, listening to my podcast than you would watching it in 360 because you're going to be doing other things anyway. You're going to be washing the car or running or doing your chores or commuting into work. And so you already have like partial attention, but you're able to really listen and kind of go into these really deep places. So I would argue that it's better to hear someone tell a story about a virtual reality experience than you to see a 360 video of it. And that's because it's kind of like the difference between reading a novel and watching the movie of Harry Potter. You know, like you're having a director that's showing you what you should be thinking. Rather, if you're reading it, it's actually coming from your own mind. And so one of the things that I did uh, recently was listen to Alex Bloomberg's uh, training on like storytelling in audio. And that audio is a very visual language because it requires people to put the pictures together in their own minds. And 
as I'm asking people to tell their favorite memories and their stories and what they want to see, that's putting the listeners of this podcast into a space where they're starting to really expand their mind in terms of envisioning it for themselves. And then they can go create it in VR rather than just trying to show them. So there's another dimension aside from logistics. I think just from a storytelling perspective, that audio for what I'm doing is just works way better. All sorts of different reasons, but that's some of the big ones. So yeah. The question here was that the Voices of VR podcast does seem to be bridging the academic VR and consumer VR. It's basically asking how much are people trying to reinvent the wheel or if there's a lot of ideas that have been floating around for a couple of decades. So are we in an implementation and execution stage or are we still inventing the core concepts? Yeah, I think it goes both ways. There's a lot of innovation that's happening so quickly that in some domains that the consumer VR is going above and beyond what the academic VR is doing. But at the same time, there's a whole lot of arrogance and ignorance within the consumer VR community in terms of what's already been done. People will say statements like, oh, this is the first time that X has happened. And it's like, uh, no, it's actually not. Or more than that, that's more about ego, but more about the actual like research that's been done. There's a lot to be learned. And at GDC this year, there was a number of academics that came and gave a panel of like, what does the academic community have to teach the VR developers? And at IEEE VR, just a week later, they had a, a reverse of, of what can the game developers teach the academics. And so I did a couple of interviews, actually three interviews with the panelists, Rob Lindemann, Doug Bowman, and Anthony Steed, talking about those discussions about that specifically, like what they have to teach each other. And so, yeah, there's a lot of things, especially in terms of presence and the virtual body ownership illusion and redirected walking. You know, it's funny because the Void actually independently recreated redirected walking on their own. You know, they just happened to have a magician who was an illusionist who figured out that he could do this perceptual trick and trick people into walking in circles and show them they're walking in a straight line, you know. But that's a technique that's been in the academic community for years, you know. So there's stuff like that as uh, they're able to look at things and problems that are five to 10 years into the future and do the basic research that's required. And also, we don't know about the long-term effects and all that stuff that will be, you know, we'll start to look at some of that stuff. But overall, I think that there's a lot to learn from each community, and it's just a humility that I think is called for to be able to really be open to listen, because there's a perception that the technology was so old when they did things that it's irrelevant. And there's a certain element where that's going to be true, especially in five to ten years, when the level of quality of a grad student art developer art and experience when they can see something from a AAA studio. There's going to be a little bit of expectation at some point where the art that's coming from the academic community is not going to be able to match to do legitimate research into VR. So there's a lot of confluences like that, but that's kind of like my, my early take. So with that, if you have any other questions, feel free to come up and, and ask me. And uh, yeah, I just wanted to thank you all for coming out and um, being listeners uh, to the Voices of VR podcast. And uh, yeah, thank you.